Okay, uh, okay, this is awkward. I went over 15 minutes, and so I used my little uh, software here to trim it down to 15 minutes, so I'm not entirely sure where uh, I dropped off, so I may repeat myself a bit here. But um, Andrew Knight, who was in South Africa at the time, is now at the Imperial College in uh, uh, outside of London. Um, he and uh, Richard Cowling, who's also in South Africa, wrote a couple of papers in 2007. So the first one is knowing but not doing. And the argument here is that uh, despite the fact that we have all this information that's starting to accrue about where we should do stuff, that turns out not to be what we do often. And that uh, there may be reasons why uh, action doesn't follow uh, what we think to be the right priority. And in, in particular, they're arguing that um, we have made the assumption in setting these priorities that the only thing that matters is biological diversity. And that's a very foolish assumption that people matter and people's opinions matter and, and, that, and that they have a say in what protected areas go in where and that, these social, the, that we should be paying more attention to social sciences and thinking about uh, social pressures on where we do what. And that this is also followed by this uh, paper embracing opportunism and selecting priority conservation areas that, um, that people uh, pick out areas for protection for all sorts of reasons and that we shouldn't be uh, uh, snooty and stick to the highest priority ones. We should uh, take what uh, is of value and embrace that opportunity as it poses itself. So uh, somewhere in there, um, the, uh, gee, I bet I can look it up in just a second. Where paper, where was the year was that paper? Uh, 2004, um, it was. Um, that a paper by a bunch of people from the Center for Applied Biodiversity Science, this was uh, part of Conservation International, that's the little blue and green logo that they paid buttloads of money to have designed that no one can figure out. Uh, but they um, got this big grant from the Moore Foundation mm -hmm. and was really the finest department of conservation biology in the continent for a long time. Uh, but this was a product of a NC's working group uh, that they went and said, well, how are we doing? Um, and note Bob Pressey's an author in here uh, in, the, in the middle. Uh, but that they're looking at trying to assess the degree to which protected areas around the world are actually capturing species that we're trying to protect. And so the, f um, the um, current networks column that represents uh, how many mammals, turtles, amphibians, etc., that are being, um, that have been captured on some of the network of protected areas. And uh, this represents, you know, an assessment, assessment of 11,500 species. And they say, well, you know, 12 and a half, 12 percent have been captured somewhere. If you, you can expand this out to include these protected areas plus these IUCN protection categories one through four, you get more habitat in, in that second bin. And they say that, you know, a quarter of species have been uh, protected. The three columns to the right, uh, equal area sites, variable site, area, area, variable area sites, and tropical bias are three different random null models and said, how, what fraction of these species might we predict to capture um, if we just tossed out um, reserves randomly? And um, the message that they say is that, well, they've done better than random, and but that they have a long way to go and that um, they aren't that there's needs to be a lot of thought in doing protection, but you know if you look down at this, uh, this 16.4%, uh, 19.7%, percent, 11.4% 11 of these three different things. The tropical bias doesn't do very well, uh, but these other things, they don't do that much worse than uh, the current network, and they do better than just the PAs. And so, it suggests that uh, we have uh, a, a system that's driven by a lot of capriciousness and and that design doesn't necessarily uh, result in actions. So that said, you know, Bob Pressey, there he is in the lower left. Uh, he started in 1993, still going strong on this idea of, of systematic conservation planning. And uh, at first, it was really about the biology. And he has really taken on this idea of embracing the social component of this. He used to be in New South Wales, Australia. Now he's at the James Cook University up in Townsend. Um, and what they do is they lot of, use a lot of uh, geographic information system uh, in, uh, layers of information to try and identify what might be the best set of, of reserves that you could uh, protect. 
but they do it in a very social context and so they're going to get a bunch of stakeholders together and they're going to sit around computers and say well what would happen if you did this and what would happen if you do that and what would happen if you protect this other thing and the, I, the argument that they make is that this is the way to bring stakeholders who have divergent opinions together to try and uh, satisfy all of their uh, their joint needs now uh, so it started out as uh, basically a biological prioritization of where species are found in the landscape and has evolved into this massive uh, um, uh, a set of steps sorry I'm gonna go jump down here this is the massive set of steps that uh, Pressy and Bottrill uh, engage in so there's 11 stages and each stage has sub stages and you know so scoping and costing the in, in the planning process identifying involving stakeholders identifying the context for conservation areas identifying the conservation goals collecting socioeconomic data collecting data on the biodiversity and the natural features setting conservation targets reviewing the targets uh, achievement in existing conservation areas selecting additional conservation areas and then applying actions and so this is looks again like a lot of these other structures that um, uh, because they're all evolving uh, to solve the same problem at the same time uh, just in different places around the world with different specific uh, issues they're trying to address uh, if you look back up at grows and their uh, seven steps it's identifying targets collect information identifying information gaps at station establish goals and uh, assess the con existing areas so it, it, it's all uh, very similar but under all of this, uh, oh yeah, and so on the right here is the Margulis and Pressy uh, version of this in 2000, uh, which was much more biological and a lot less sociological that they've evolved into this uh, thinking about how you really need to engage uh, people in the process. So uh, concurrent with all this, a couple of tools emerged that we'll spend some time talking about on Thursday, Marks and Zonation. And they, they differ sort of in a very fundamental way, but they, all, they come to, well, people who have taken them and applied them to the same problems have come to uh, suggest that they lead to the same kinds of answers. So Mark Sand starts with a philosophy of building an efficient network. So uh, you have nothing, you want to protect areas, you're going to identify the thing that uh, adds the most value to the reserve network and put it in and then find the thing that adds the next most value where value is not just species richness but it's also involved it also involves complementarity finding you know capturing new species in that reserve system and may have a penalty for having s lots of small fragmented isolated populations so uh, that you're building things based on some criteria of creating a set of reserves and it's trying to minimize the cost of doing so so you may be able to protect these five species uh, in five different sites or in one site and one uh, answer will be more efficient than others because you're building up from nothing, um, you're, there are lots of different solutions and it, it becomes a huge permutation problem and as a consequence they have to use um, um, fancy mathematics, they use something called simulated annealing to f find that minimum set that achieves all those goals. Zonation really starts from a fund fundamentally different place. It's saying uh, you have a landscape um, Let's now then uh, think about how you could maximize the protection of biodiversity by removing or changing the land cover of those sites that have the least value to your objectives, your goals. So it's removing sites of minimum value as you move through the uh, process. And I'm going to try and just go through this very quickly. We're going to do this more on Thursday. But you know, Mark Sands is a product of the University of Queensland, and uh, it's free and as a kind has a support group and as a consequence it's very very widely used and it, it's trying to uh, fix this problem so imagine one through ten here are attributes that you're trying to capture in a reserve and that a through h are different uh, sites that you could capture and that so site a has the highest biodiversity b and c next but there's not a lot of complementarity in a b and c that you're capturing a lot of the same things and uh, in each case you, uh, getting two out of those three you'd miss something. Uh, whereas if you came down here and got something like B, C, and um, E you have more complementarity across those ranges and maybe get replication on uh, each of those targets that you're trying to capture and so there may be an optimal solution uh, that doesn't even include the thing with the highest species richness, the one with the highest scorecard value, and that this uh, then is looking for efficient 
uh, solutions based on complementarity to try and get a comprehensive reserve network that adequately covers everything of the representative targets that you're trying to identify. That's the goal. There's a lot more detail about how that happens. Uh, Zonation uh, out of the University of Helsinki, uh, Ati Molinen. Uh, maybe it's not a coincidence that a socialist, a formerly socialist country, is looking at how you can uh, minimize damage by, by in things that change because there's more state control over how things um, happen. But in some ways, zonation is a uh, conceptually simpler and maybe more gratifying approach in that it's using uh, lots of data, any number of GIS data layers to create uh, sort of features and, and weights that you're looking for and then uh, runs through the zonation program to identify areas of higher and lower uh, performance area. And so fundamentally they're starting with an intact uh, landscape or the landscape that's as intact as it is, identifying things that you're trying to protect and then saying let's remove uh, the, the site of least value and then the next one of least value and the next one of least value. Always uh, again uh, not just uh, on a scorecard approach but also thinking about complementarity and so part of the metric is how much of something that you tr are trying to protect is left and so a site that has the last site for a particular thing, it's the only thing on that site, might still uh, be uh, of high value and then you can run different models and, and so the algorithm is starts from the full landscape, determine the cell with the least marginal value, um, and remove it, update the occurrence levels, and then repeat it again and again. And So here you'd have some sort of values for a set of cells. Uh, you identify those with the least value, you can remove that one, then what you'd want to be looking at is, is this the one with the number five, the next least value, or are those species on those two red cells on the upper left uh, the only places where those species occur, in which case then that one with the five on it would gain considerably more value. But if there's, uh, those are species that are found in other areas, it'd be less value. And so it has this um, a core area zonation module and uh, the math looks something like this where you're going to remove the cell for which you can minimize uh, the sum of or the you know a function of uh, summing across species uh, the weight of that species how much value you place in that species um, the proportion of the remaining distribution of that species in the remaining part of the landscape and uh, and the cost of the site and so again it has it's looking for an efficient solution to this and so it's looking to minimize uh, the value based on cost uh, and how much is remaining. So it carries some complementarity issues as well. Well, that's as far as I'm going to get into it uh, here. Uh, on uh, Tomorrow on lecture, I'll go into it uh, more uh, deeply, and we'll try and look through some uh, examples of these uh, cases and what they've done for conservation. All right, thanks. See you tomorrow.